Greece and its outlying islands. Before we go, I do want to say that I am a birder of some 20 years and a photographer about the same time. I'm also heavily into bird conservation. I've been on the board of Bird Conservation Network, which is a coalition of 30 organiz 24 organizations in the Chicago area that uh, supports conservation of birds. Birds need all the help they can get these days, folks. I know if you have any interest at all, you've read that in the past 50 years, we've lost about 4 billion birds, individual birds. So if you can possibly feed birds this winter, I heartily encourage you to do it. Whatever kind of feeders you can put out for seed or for um, suet for the woodpeckers, even and particularly water, moving water or water that doesn't freeze a heated bird bath, all very helpful to birds in the winter. One of our most beloved Chicago area birds is a Northern Cardinal, and it never even used to come to Chicago uh, in the winter until people started feeding. So with that, I will say, we're gonna go off to sunny Greece and um, hopefully get all warmed and fuzzied from seeing how beautiful and, and uh, sunny it is there. Uh, we started, uh, flew, we flew from Chicago to Amsterdam, sat on the ground for five hours and then another three hours to, uh, to Athens, Greece. Uh, uh, these maps are terrible, but it's all I could find on the internet. Uh, the white that you see there is all of mainland Greece and uh, some little of the outlying, outlying islands. Lesvos, where we will be doing most of our birding, is encircled in a red uh, oval up to the upper right. And as you can see, it's extremely close to Turkey. Uh, it's the third largest of the uh, uh, Greek islands. Uh, once again, just an overview to show you that um, how, how very, very close uh, uh, Lesvos is to Turkey. Uh, the star is Athens and the what looks like a large island to the left of Athens is not an island, it's the Peloponnese Peninsula. Um, so we arrived and our, our group of three felt like we wanted to go have a beer somewhere and the person at our hotel says, said, why don't you go to the top of a hotel in the Plaka and overlook the Acropolis of Athens? So this is exactly where we are from this picture right now. The, the mountain itself is the Acropolis and the building is the Parthenon. And a Eurasian colleague Dove joined us at the rooftop lounge. We decided that was a good omen. Here's what he sounded like. Not, not like our morning doves. So we started off hiking up to the, uh, to the top, to the height of Athens overlooking the city. And uh, it was a pretty good hike. Our Eurasian magpie was on the lawn while we were walking and flew away. On the walk up were the ruins of the theater of Dion Dionysus, Eutherius on the south slope of the Acropolis. Um, this was an enormous, enormous ruin. Uh, it, they said it would have seated 5,000 people. I'm not quite sure how that would happen, but uh, it was a wonderful ruin. And at last we got up there to see the Parthenon. This building was spectacular when it was whole, uh, but there was a war shortly after it was finished. And uh, so it's been in ruins, although re rebuilt as best they could possibly do. Um, is as much as much as they could possibly do. We were not the only people up there. You can see this is a very popular uh, place to go. And uh, the uh, restoration work continues apace. This is the uh, temple of the Caryatids. Um, the original Caryatids are, uh, uh, there's a couple of them in the, in the museum here in Athens and the rest of them are in the British Museum. But this is what it looked like. And of course, it's a woman in draped clothing that basically is the pillars. This is the city of Athens below, about 665,000 people, 665,000 people. Um, and that's a very foggy day for, for Athens. Um, 
after after we got back down, we went to the new Acropolis Museum in Athens, which is a very attractive building and very contemporary. Uh, but they built it right on top of some um, some Greek ruins, which uh, they managed to figure out how to handle that. They just put the runway walk up to the museum right over the over the ruins and save the ruins. Inside there were many treasures. Uh, these are two of the original caryatids. Um, I wasn't gonna take you through that whole museum, but it, it definitely is worthy of a visit if you ever go there. Um, we next wanted, wanted to see the changing of the guard uh, at the presidential palace. And these are the Greek guard or Azones which are elite Greek soldiers who perverts, uh, perform ceremonial duties. Um, this is a very formal, fancy uniform and uh, it's much beloved and it, it's very, it takes a long time to put it together. And I'm sure those guys aren't allowed to gain a pound by how tight they are. Um, these are the shoes that they wear. They wear about six and a half pounds a piece and they feature 80 nails on the base of the show. The concept is that when they walk, it sounds like battle. It sounds like a battle zone. The toe of the Sarukia is pointed upwards and you can see the black silk pom-pom. This is the new guards coming in. As you can see, they take their, very, their, their duties very seriously and there is not a smile to be found. Uh, they do a little bit of kicking up at their feet and raising their guns, but it's just a normal uh, um, usual presentation. We walk through the Plaka afterwards, which is the old city. It's very close to um, the uh, Parthenon. Lots of shops, souvenir shops. With, and you can see up in the upper right in the background, you see the, the Parthenon and the Acropolis. So you can see that it's all easy walking distance. The, um, the It's a charming area, the Plaka. It's not just for tourists. This is where people go and buy their produce and so on and so forth. Uh, almost everything that we went, almost every place we ate, uh, the cafes, tavernas, restaurants are open air. And it was cobbled streets and shops and just very easy going pretty and warm. And in the park by gum, the pigeons look just much just like our pigeons. So we took off from Athens. This, the purpose of this trip was birding and birders really don't do anything other than bird for the most part. You can see in the background, the Mediterranean and some of the Greek islands. So this is the island that we flew to and it is known as Lesbos. And the uh, airport is down in the lower right-hand corner, Mytilene or Mytilene. Um, the, uh, the size of the island is about 631 square miles. You can see all the roads and, uh, and the red star uh, in the center of the uh, picture is, is where our hotel was located. Um, that is based on Coloni, Coloni or Colonus Bay. Uh, which is an inlet from the Aegean Sea. And, uh, and it is, of course, salt water. Um, the roads go everywhere on the island and we covered most of those roads. Um, it is uh, mountainous and volcanic. Uh, and, um, and then there's some nice beach areas. The island is famed for the finest olive oil in the world, over 11 million olive trees. And the Greek food is genuinely delicious and um, uh, mostly features fresh fish. But my mostly the reason I went to Lesbos with my friends is that it's primarily known as the best one of the best bird watching locations in the Mediterranean. Tourism is just in its infancy infancy on Lesbos, and so as a result, uh, for birders, it's not hugely crowded, which is terrific. This is a little owl. There are a ton of little owls on this island. And that's so unusual because mostly owls are very secretive and they're nocturnal. Uh, this is a diurnal owl, means it's out during the daytime. 
it's a rural island. Once you get out of Mytilene, the, the, the capital city where we arrived, it's a rural island with scattered villages. And we stopped at this little spot. And this village was all about fishing. And you can see those are fishing boats with the nets. And you can see from the restaurant, fresh calamari, shrimp saganaki, spaghetti seafood, risotto seafood, fish soup. It was all about fish. We were amused that they had old time movie star photos on the walls. And finally, we arrived at the Colony Bay Hotel. This was a beautiful spot with gorgeous rose gardens. This veranda went all the way around the hotel. We were sitting there shortly after arrival in broad daylight, which this picture is not in broad daylight, but I have to show this particular corner because an owl flew right through the veranda. And here we were a bunch of birders and none of us could agree on what the owl was, but finally our leader said, no, 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 he knew it was a barn owl. This is a barn owl. Of course, I didn't get a shot of the one that went through, but this is a barn owl I took recently. Um, there were many owls on Lesbos, not just the, the little owls. Um, there, near our hotel was a fishing village named Scala Colony. And we found paradise right there in Scala Colony. It, it was the paradise restaurant. As I said, mostly everything's open air. Uh, surprisingly enough, there was a monument to Aristotle uh, right here on the Gulf of Colony, and uh, he—I had—I always thought of him as a philosopher, but his uh, system of classification for sci scientific taxonomy uh, stood for over two thousand years. So this is where Aristotle figured all that out. There were sandy beaches on the huge Colony Bay. And early on arrival, we found a hooded crow. Now our crows, as you know, are all black. This is a hooded crow and here's what he sounded like. Pretty close to our crow actually, but he sure doesn't look like our crow. In the marsh across from the hotel uh, were a, a black stork. In, uh, above the black stork in the center is a barn swallow. And in the lower left corner, you can just catch a little bit of the head of a black winged stilt. Three species in one photo is not too shabby. That's supposed to be the black stork. What an unusual looking bird. Black legs, black beak, and then that uh, orbital ring, red orbital ring around his eye. He was a stunner. And, and he had a nice iridescence in the, in the sunlight uh, to his, his feathers. Um, also in this same marsh, the larger bird is a little egret. You can tell it's a little egret because you can see its golden slippers. In this country, we would call it a snowy, but it's a different species. And the smaller one is a squawk heron. They have uh, white wings. Here's a better shot of a black wing stilt. That's what a little black wing stilt sounds like. This is the male you can see from the black, the black on the back of his head. Here's the female. She doesn't have, she doesn't have that black on the back of the head. They have amazingly long legs and long beak for probing, probing in the mud. We also had some adult barn swallows flying around. This was a baby with mom and dad above and below. This is the same barn swallow we have in this country. It's a very prominent bird around here. Uh, you can, you can, they're defined by that wonderful forked tail. And uh, of course, mom and dad are taking very good care of that little one. Kind of subtle ch chittering as they're called. Here's the male uh, adult uh, perched on the wire with that nice kind of chestnut face and white belly. A great tit hung, hung out in the evergreens. Now, great tits I always thought of as a British bird, but uh, this, and this, this bird may, may very well go on up to England. This, is, this trip was in May. Kind of a sweet musical song. Another great tit. 
and crested larks were very common around the hotel. That's their song. Another crested lark. Local flora. And common house martins were building a mud nest on one of the walls of the hotel's veranda. I mean, it was fascinating to watch, but I'm sure the hotel wasn't too pleased about it. Anyway, they would leave, they would leave that there until the, until the babies were hatched. That's the sort of chittering call of the house martins. Every morning before breakfast, and I mean before breakfast, we were allowed to grab coffee and some juice. We would leave to go to the Alikis wetlands, uh, which were, oh, maybe a 20 minute drive from the hotel. Um, the reason is that uh, this was spring and some birds were, would be coming up from Africa and heading north into Europe to breed so that every morning there would be likely something new at the Alikis wet, wetlands. Uh, this is very shallow water. You can see the birds way out there. Um, and there are uh, salt pans uh, nearby, the Colony, because it's Colony Bay, which remember I mentioned is salt water, uh, salt pans. Uh, there's the mountain of salt that were, have, has been harvested at the salt pans. Man, that would fill a lot of salt shakers. Without fail, every morning there were greater flamingos. Those are just amazing birds. I, they have to feed with their head upside down. But I love the fact that in this one in particular, you can see the, the wonderful configuration of the beak. And then the coloration, de depending on how much um, crustaceans they manage to find, their colors will get darker pink. This is just a little sound of, of the flamingos. The squawk heron that you saw flying over in the uh, marsh across the street from the hotel is also here. That's a pretty common bird. This particular squawk heron I wanted to show you because he's in high breeding plumage. And the reason you can tell that is that he has um, the green in front of his eye, between his eye and his bill. That, uh, that demarcates a bird that's wanting to find a lady friend and start a family. We found a pair of spotted red shanks one morning. And then a wood sandpiper. Sorry about that piece of grass, but that's what was there. Lesbos is so amazing. Where else would you ever find a flock of flamingos with a bunch of multicolored sheep grazing in the background? Just an amazing sight. There's also a gull over there on the left. I don't know what kind of gull that is, but probably yellow-legged. Um, they were just so graceful. More than once when we checked out what was new at, this, at the uh, salt pans, we would be heading back to the hotel for breakfast and we'd be headed, held up by a slow moving flock of sheep. I'm telling you, when you've got some hungry birders, you wanted to, you wanted to get that, those sheep moving, but I'm telling you, they just took their sweet time and ambled up the road and finally turned off and we could go get our breakfast. We, none of us starved, but we sometimes thought we were. Here's a flyby of the flamingos where you really get to see the colors of the birds, which is it's amazing. These colors aren't, aren't, aren't visible when they're just standing and feeding. Here was a, a white stork uh, as opposed to the black stork. He has the, the red legs and a red beak, but uh, black and white feathering. That's not a call, that, that's him clacking his feet. There, there he is flying around. Nice wingspan. 
one morning we had a collared Prandon call that had come in overnight. Uh, that's his call. So there are forests um, on the uh, island of Lesvos. In fact, Lesvos actually means wooded. Uh, so um, the best bird on the island was nesting here, we had been told. And uh, so we went over and sure enough, we found it. This is a Cooper's nuthatch. Now this bird is the best bird on the island because it really belongs in Turkey. Uh, now, mind you, it's only three and a half miles or so from from uh, Lesvos to Turkey, but but this is the only Krupper's net house hatch anybody had found, and there were a pair, and that that is where the nest is in the hole. Uh, we stayed very far away. I'm shooting with a 400 millimeter lens, so I'm not on top of this bird. We didn't want to ever disturb these these sweet babies with their these sweet birds with their babies. Here's their call. Now, that, that's, to us, that's not a typical nuthatch call. Uh, our nuthatches have a call that goes eh, eh, eh. So th to me, this is not a proper nuthatch call, but I'm admitting this is indeed a, a nuthatch. And that the you on Cooper should have an umlaut over it, but I've had trouble getting that in. And right nearby in the forest was a common chaffinch. Once again, what I consider a British bird, he just found a nice insect. That's his call. And then he's, he went up on a poured cement cross and sang his heart out. What a, what a sweetheart. We found this scops owl in a grove of eucalyptus trees. He was trying to sleep, but it was clear that he knew we had discovered him. He, however, didn't uh, hoot for us, but I will uh, play what they would sound like if indeed he would wake up and want to make us make himself known. That's all. We found a long-eared owl on our hotel grounds. This is really unusual, folks. I mean, owls are not usually easy to see. And other than the little owls, these are all nocturnal. Uh, we do have long-eared owls in this country, just as we have um, uh, the, uh, the other, the other uh, long-eared and, and other uh, great horns. Kind of hard to hear that one, sorry. Uh, European bee eaters would come in most days. They overwinter in Africa and are heading, heading north to Europe. Probably would not stay on the island to breed. That was their call. We were in a pasture looking for some, some birds. And boy, this mare sure didn't like us being there. She came after us with uh, her teeth bared. I think maybe this was why he was a cute little fellow. But right there in the pasture with the horses, we found a black headed wagtail. Here was the wag, here's what the wagtail sounded like. And also in the same pasture, a blue headed yellow wagtail. I think I'm afraid I forgot to put a sound on that one. Here's what it looks like when we were driving around the island. That is the Mediterranean or the Aegean Sea in the background. But the island, as you can see, is lush and green. And uh, there, there are the remains of a volcano or two up in the higher altitudes. But uh, these, these pictures, I don't do a lot of photo enhancing. This is the color of the water. We went down to this rocky beach and um, somebody told me to go stick my hand in the water. Holy cow, there are thermal vents out there and that water was just boiling hot. 
um, not certainly not a place where you wanted to go for a, a swim, that's for sure. Uh, we found a sub subalpine warbler. He also had a nice little insect. I would like to say that the insects were not a problem for us as birders. Of course, most smart birders wear long sleeves and long pants all the time. So bugs don't usually bother you, but for all the bugs that you're seeing in these birds' mouths, that's how they make a living, but bugs were not an issue. Here's his call. And then we found a long-legged buzzard flying overhead. Most birds of prey have that sort of a call. Then he did manage to sit down on a post for us, so we got a good look at him. There's another call. And uh, at the wetlands, a white-faced ibis. Uh, now you might say, Mary Lou, where is the white face? Well, right around going around the eye where the beak, uh, the feathers right around the, where it touches the beak, that's that line is what the taxonomist decided was making it a white-faced ibis. It does have nice iridescence on it and it probes in the, in the mud and sand for its crustaceans. If it's gonna talk, that's what it'll sound like. <laughs> Here were some glossy ibises flying by. I did not get a shot of them with their coloration. They are different. They look much like the one you just saw, but without the white face. But I love the I love the symmetry of this silhouettes. <laughs> Similar sound of white faced ibis. The corn poppies were in bloom, and they were gorgeous. I thought that the poppy fields were absolutely breathtaking, but I was told that this wasn't a particularly good year for poppies. I thought it was a fine year for poppies, but look at that water, folks. I, uh, this is not an enhanced photo in any way, shape or form. Anyway, you may have heard that uh, Lesbos has, because it's so close to Turkey, that there's been a tremendous number of refugees that have gotten over to Lesbos from Turkey um, it's been pretty, it's been a problem for the island as a problem for Greece overall. There are a lot of refugees in Greece right now, but when we were there, which was three years ago, uh, May of 2017, this processing area was, was empty. Um, I, uh, I, I know that there is a international rescue committee that exists now to try to help the refugees. I, I've been told that the people of Lesbos, who are very friendly, shared their food and tried to help the immigrants and tried to get them on ferries over to the mainland where they could possibly find jobs and homes. But, uh, and there was a word out that there were refugees all over and was hurting their business, but um, I wasn't aware of that. I didn't see any. So uh, we stopped for lunch at a little restaurant at Scala Sikiminius and, um, there weren't any tables available, so they just set one up at the dock. And here's our group. Uh, it was warm enough, everybody was having Greek beer for lunch uh, because it just tasted so darn good. It was cheaper and easier and tastier than Coke too. And the local kitty cats were waiting for handouts from the, from the diners, but they looked pretty well fed. This is the menu. What a joke that was, look at, look at this. It's all in Greek. Of course, there's no way you can figure out what it, um, what it means, but, but the owner just sent food to us. Uh, the, the segment in the upper left-hand corner is, is the ouzos, that they have so many varieties of ouzo. Now, ouzo is the national drink of Greece, and um, it, it's a clear anise-flavored liquor. Uh, the the carafe on the left is the clear, and and the on the glasses on the right that look kind of milky white, um, 
are because it's either had some ice or some water added to it. So it's not it's not my taste, um, but the Greeks love it and it's it's internationally renowned. Uh, this was the meal. The owner just kept sending dishes and dishes, octopus, shrimp, fish. Um, so we said, no mas, no mas. With, uh, look at the shrimp head on the lower plate. Anyway, uh, the food was good and plentiful. And there were also cute stores in this little village. And after lunch, we found a Sardinian warbler. That's his kind of chittering call. And then we found a skulky little bittern. This was a good bird to find. That's his kind of spooky call. And overhead was a yellow-legged gull. Like I said before, that was probably the one that was down with the flamingos as well. Here's his call. <coughs> then we found a middle spotted woodpecker. This is not my photograph. This bird was in the shade and there was a nesting hole and I, I could not get a decent picture, but I thought you should see. It, because he doesn't look like our woodpeckers. And um, I thought he was pretty, pretty handsome fellow. So this is off the internet. We also saw a fair number of Spanish sparrows. These look a little bit like our, our winter tree sparrows. Here's what they sound like. We also found some red rump swallows. This fellow isn't being congenial enough to show his red rump. Then uh, we ran across these fellows, uh, uh, not so common, common shell duck. That's an interesting sort of uh, shield that it has uh, above its, its beak. <laughs> That's the shell duck that wants you to know it's there. Then we had a flyby of a ruddy shell duck. And then we had five absolutely fabulous white wing terns fly by. What beautiful birds and what flyers they are. <laughs> So I got a panorama just to give you an idea of how fabulous and how many flamingos there were. It's a great way to start your morning, seeing and listening to these guys. We also found a red-backed red -backed shrike. We have shrikes around here occasionally, very rarely. But these were quite prevalent. And then we had a wood chat shrike. Completely different call and different feathering. And then we found a black headed bunting. Wasn't going to call for us. Now these are rock nuthatches. Now it, I have trouble with rock nuthatches because nuthatches are supposed to be on trees, but these guys weren't. And, uh, and, and nuthatches, typically nuthatches will come down head first on it. They'll circle a tree going down head first, but these were doing their thing on rocks. So here's their call. And then right there on the rocks, we found a chucker, uh, which is a, a, an unusual looking uh, little guy. It's a partridge. Here's his call. And right there, we also found a Balkan green lizard. He didn't have any sound. So we drove a mountain road uh, and you can see how the roads are. And this is mostly the way the roads are on the island. 
up to a Byzantine ministry, a monastery uh, that kind of looks like a, a castle uh, from architecture. Uh, this thing has been around a long time. It was founded at 800 AD and is the oldest monastery in Lesbos. It was very well maintained. We didn't see any monks at all, but it was clear that they were there because it was simply pristine. This is the interior. Uh, you notice that there's a stepladder in the background there, uh, but it's uh, it has been uh, had a fire and has been rebuilt, um, but it, it certainly was a lovely spot. And then we climb these, this picture doesn't make it look as scary as it was. These are very narrow stairs with very low railings. Uh, but I was glad to, that I got up to the bell tower. On the way up, we ran across this sweet kitty. And there's the view of the Western side of the island from the monastery bell tower. And of course that's the Aegean or the Mediterranean in the background. So when we were out and they were not near villages, we would have a field lunch. We were at Seagree Beach here. And without fail, the lunch was feta cheese, Kalamata olives, and bread. That's it, guys. I have never felt the same about feta cheese, <laughs> Kalamata olives, and bread since this trip. But on the other hand, the scenery was so good, who could care about what you were having for lunch? This is what it looked like not enhanced pictures. Here's another beach that we've got to. And on this beach was a tank gun. And I looked up NK-10 on the internet, and this is from World War I. Obviously, this was defenses during World War I. We ran across a great cormorant. These, of course, are, are fish eaters and swimmers and uh, this guy um, had, they all do have a nice turquoise eye, but this guy was really, had a really stunning lighting on that beautiful aquamarine eye. That's, that's the noise they make. And we found a black eared weed ear. He also had found some lunch. And then we found these little diurnal owl, little owls all over the island on rooftops like this one. On lichen colored covered rocks. And on more rocks. It's a strange little call. So it was a delightful trip for birds and the enjoyment of Greece, its people, and its stunning natural beauty. We had 152 species of birds, many of which were life birds for me, which of course is what birders are all about. The last little owl says, yasas, which is Greek for goodbye. Thanks for watching, folks. Now, do I stop screen sharing or what do I do, Terry? Um, I would leave the screen up and I will just um, tell you what the questions were. Okay. Um, but I'm curious, what do you mean by a life bird? Oh, <laughs> yes, that's a very good question. Well, what, birders count the birds they see. Uh, and, and a life bird is when you see a bird for the first time. So if you, if you see, uh, a, a yellow warbler at Skokie Lagoons, you count that bird, but I've seen warblers, yellow warblers before, so it's not, a, it's not a big deal. But what you want is life birds. That's why you travel to see birds that you could never see at your own home. So um, I have been birding for 20 years. I have, and I've done a lot of traveling. I have about six, six I'm sorry, about 3000 birds on my life list. Wow. Birders are very, very precise about their lists. It's, it's innate to birding. All right, there's a couple questions here. Um, would love to know how you get your recordings of the bird songs. Oh, interesting. There's a wonderful site 
uh, uh, available on the internet, and it's called Xenocanto. It's X E N O dash C A N T O. And birders who record the um, the birds submit them to Xenocanto. And so uh, you go to Xenocanto, and now, now there's over 10,000 species of birds in the world. So you've got to have the name right, and sometimes it helps if you have the um excuse me if it helps to have the the latin name but you enter the bird and then it'll it give you a drop down of a bunch of recordings and you just listen to the one to tell them till you find that one that you think is right for what you know the bird to be or or, or it sounds like the best uh, recording so xenocanto.org org all right another question do these birds stay on the islands or do they migrate well, many of them continue on up to Europe, but a lot of the ones that we saw on this were, were residents. Um, like, remember I said the bee eaters were gonna go on to Europe and uh, the, uh, there are a number of others, uh, but some of them will stay around and some of them will, will, will go. Um, but we were there in May, so, so, you know, and I'm not really always sure which ones were migratory except that the new ones that would come in overnight that we would see out at the wetlands, you knew those were migrators, they weren't gonna stick around. All right, how long were you there? Did you fly out of Athens? Uh, yes, uh, we flew out of Athens. I spent uh, two or three days in Athens the first time and we had to fly back to Athens to then fly out home. There's, there's no international airport in Mytilene. Um, so it was a couple of days in um, it was a couple of days in Athens on our own, and then uh, April twenty eighth to May sixth, birding. So and that and that's birding from dawn till till dusk. Um, we didn't have to go out for owls. You typically on a birding trip you go out on a night walk for owls, but all the owls were very much out for us to look at during the day. So it was about seven eight days. It was a great trip, lovely trip. The Greeks are lovely, very friendly people. Um, they want to know how you identify the birds with a phone app or? Well, when you're on a birding trip, you have a birding guide with you. And in this case, we had two. And uh, they tell you what you're looking at. And uh, then, then when you get home, you go through your pictures. <laughs> and then, then the trick is to try to figure out what it is that you've gotten pictures of. But usually every night when you come in from a day of birding before dinner, you go through the checklist of what you've seen that day. And usually when I'm going through the checklist, I put a P beside the birds that I've photographed. And uh, that helps me to decide what, I, what I've gotten when it's all said and done. Um, but, but if push comes to shove, I can always send the photograph to one of the leaders and ask them what it is. For the most part, I think I got these all right, but that's right. a good question. In your opinion, what's your best time of year to visit Greece and Lesbos? Well, we were there in May and I thought it was wonderful. Uh, uh, you know, a, a birding group picks the time of year for when you're likely to get the best birds and May is during spring migration. By the way, spring migration happens in Chicago too. So May is, May is, you want to be everywhere at one time in, in, in the month of May, but uh, May was perfectly beautiful. We didn't, I don't think we had a drop of rain. Uh, you could see the kind of weather we had, uh, only occasionally a little haze. So, but I, I have been to Greece before, before I was a birder. And I think mostly the summer months are just fine. Uh, and I don't know what it's like in the winter, but almost all those restaurants are open air. I think it stays pretty temperate. Uh, around around the around the calendar. Hey, there's two questions that are similar. Um, if you're looking to go on a birding trip and you are new to it, how can you evaluate whether it's a good trip? And then, do you have a favorite birding group to travel with? Yes, yes, um, yeah. You know, you 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 take a flyer in the beginning because you don't know what you're doing. Uh, when I I first signed up for a professional birding trip. I went with an outfit that I'd heard of called Victor Emanuel Nature Tours. 
And I took a, a beginning birder trip to High Island, Texas. I would suggest staying within the US. And uh, this beginning birder trip, uh, High Island, Texas is where the birds that are migrating from South America back to go uh, to breed up in North America, they cross the Gulf of Mexico and, 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 and High Island, Texas is where the birds land first. And um, that happened to be the year of a fallout, which was uh, very, very lucky for me. Sorry, um, because a fallout, it means that the winds change. When the birds are coming across the Gulf of Mexico, the birds are now flying into the wind. And when they, they land on shore, they are exhausted and they are they pile up right at the shore. It was an incredible experience. It's not good for birds, but it's great for birders. I saw a ton of birds. And of course, I was hooked on birding as a as an avocation. Um, I have evolved from Victor Emanuel Nature Tours. I took many trips with them. I think they're outstanding. Um, I, I've evolved to the outfit that I went with on this trip. It's called Sunrise Birding, and they're out of Coscob, Connecticut. Um, I think they are very, very good. Their prices are a little bit better than, than Victor Emanuel Nature Tour, uh, but I, I don't think you can go wrong with any of the big, any of the big tour companies. Sun, Sunrise Birding is, is a smaller one. I, I like that their groups tend to be smaller and they have really great guides. And, uh, but Victor Emanuel does a great job. They have great guides as well. There's another outfit called Field Guides. Um, there's, there's a lot of big, good big tour companies. I, I don't think you can go wrong. When I started out, I tried some bird, uh, some bird tours with um, uh, Elder Hostel, which is now Road Scholar. Those I didn't, I didn't, I wouldn't recommend because they weren't 100% birding. They were like one third birding, one third something else, one third something else. If you want, if you want to go on a birding trip, you got need to go on a birding trip. So, strongly recommend Sunrise Birding or any of the other big guys. All right. Um, just wondering if you've ever traveled to the Galapagos Islands. Ever spent time there with the blue-footed boobies? Would love to see something like that. Absolutely. Absolutely wonderful trip. Yes, I have gone to the Galapagos. Uh, it is it is a wonderful experience, um, unlike anything else. And thank goodness that they know what they've got because the Galapagos Islands are quite a ways off the coast of South America. And, um, and, and they have been untouched and they are pristine. And you do them by boat. And yes, I've seen blue-footed boobies and red-footed boobies. And, um, and sometimes the birds are just totally unafraid of you because they don't know that they're supposed to be afraid of you. It's a wonderful experience, the Galapagos. And um, I, Galapagos is a whole different ball game in terms of booking trips, but I would just go with a well-known tour operator. I went on a small boat, meaning it held about 14, 15 people. I thought that was the right way to do it because you go from island to island and I didn't want to get on these islands with 40 or 50 people. Uh, but people that have gone on the, uh, on the larger boats say they're pretty good too. But I, I, I think I got on a trimaran, uh, which had reasonably decent cabins. And, um, and, and uh, we spent, spent some time on the, out at the islands after the tour was over as well, which is certainly worth doing. That was one of the other questions. How big are the groups? Um number of people in the on these different trips uh for for the galapagos it depends on the kind of boat you pick um for a birding trip uh you know i always check to see what they're offering i i don't want to be on a birding trip with 20 birders you you have a hard enough time finding the birds and seeing them much less photographing them uh i want to be on a trip where you have probably a leader per per six or eight people if you've, I, I wouldn't want to go on a trip larger than 12 people. You saw the group I was with, that was, that was just about right. We had two leaders with that group. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I, it, I don't want to go out birding with 20 people either with the local bird clubs. Um, it's just, it's, it's just too hard to find birds. Birds only defense is being cryptic, is, is hiding and always getting behind leaves. 
So you have to have a really good guide that can find them and then get you on them. And uh, that's really the key. I'm not sure if you know this, um, but my question is, why isn't Lesbos part of Turkey since it's so close to Turkey and so far away from Greece? Yeah, it, it hasn't ever been. Um, wow. Yeah, I, I, I can't answer that. Um, there's there's a lot of um, things that, that are, um, a lot of islands that are close to Turkey, but Lesbos is the closest. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't know why it isn't, but it, 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 there's constant problem between them, the two islands, for yes, sure. I imagine. Um, before we end the recording, I just want to mention, we want to thank again, um, one of our li library patrons, Dave Ludwin, for introducing us so that you could come and do programs for our libraries. And uh, if any patrons out there know of speakers or programs they've seen, uh, I always welcome feedback because I get some of the best speakers that way. Yes, Dave, is, Dave has been one on all the bird walks that I've led uh, rocking around the slough with the Prospect Heights Natural Resources Commission. I do two bird walks in the spring and two in the fall. And uh, that's how I got, Dave, got to know Dave. He's a brilliant photographer, by the way. And, um, and, and he was the one that suggested that you contact me. So yeah, good fun. And oh, well, there'll be bird walks this spring or will it depend on, you know, the environment at the time? Well, we did them this fall. We did them this year. We, we just, we wore, we wore masks and we were outside and we stayed six or eight feet apart. And uh, to my knowledge, nobody had any problem. Um, I, I did offer to, I did say I thought it was okay. And, and, I, and I'm very, very conservative. So there will be walks and, and they will be uh, promoted by the uh, Prospect Heights Natural Resources uh, uh, Council. And I'm not so sure what the dates are now, but there'll be two in May and two in September. Well, you will be back with us in January and February and March so far. All right. Yeah. I look forward to it. I hope all of you will come back and see the next ones and be safe and be healthy. <laughs>